All right, been a while since I've done an update. Um, my opinions, beliefs, analysis, um, and ramblings about Ukraine. I got a delicious Palm Sway IPA, Island style IPA, from Coronado Brewing Company. If you're ever in the San Diego area, I highly recommend stopping by Coronado Brewing Company. That's not a paid advertisement. All right, so what I think has happened, um, and I'm going. I've updated my enemy situation uh, here a little bit uh, from what I had you know, about ten days ago. Uh, you know, like week prior to invasion. Um, kind of reflect where I think Russia is, where they're headed, what they're doing, um, and then I'm, I'm gonna then I'm gonna talk about. What's 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 gone wrong? What's going right on both sides? A little bit. Um, so early, I I called this right. These guys came straight down, uh, and they were trying to attack. The only thing I got wrong here, they weren't trying to isolate the capital. They went ahead and tried to attack the capital. Um, and it's really trying to double envelopment, right? Uh, so you have a division that came in here. From Belarus down through Chernobyl, boom. Another division plus um, may have come from Belarus, maybe on the Russia side, irrelevant. Coming down from the east, right, and trying to create that double envelopment of of Kiev. Uh, we've all, we're also seeing, I believe, at least two more divisions attacking east to west in the northern part, and this is all designed to uh, seize the capital. Um, so I said, initially I said isolate. I think that the task is seize. Uh, so I think I, I had the tactical task wrong. Um, but everything else is pretty, pretty close. Um, we see a core-ish uh, attacking east to west through the Donbass region. Um, that's no surprise. Um, I will say everything up here in the north is stalled pretty bad for Russia. Not not good. Uh, in the Donbass, they've been there longer. They have more support. They have more and more favorable more favorable conditions in the east southeast. Uh, so Russia's having more success there, uh, as you should expect them to. Um, I added a, a seize of Maripol. That's happened. Um, land and uh, amphib, uh, so kind of a double development of Maripol, um, Seas of Odessa, right? called that, that happened. Um, so it looks like they're trying to seize capital, cause um, regime change, and and then also try to sec just secure the entire southern uh, line of communication all the way uh, from the Russian border all the way over to Odessa. Um, so there are some rocket attacks and you know, some long-range fires that are happening um, west. Um, but those are scare tactics, um, terror attacks. Right, we can we can conduct a terror attack with rockets. Um, probably they probably still are hitting some C two nodes, some military targets, um, and just causing terror. Um, there's that, there's a lot of that. It's a Russian tactic would cause terror. Right, the the rockets they're firing in the Kiev are to cause terror in the population. And I'll kind of hit on this when I talk about why Ukraine's having success. <clears throat> I'll turn, take it back to this, this guy named Curtis LeMay, right? American uh, Army Air Corps, later United States Air Force uh, general. And he espoused this, I think, is a bullcrap uh, belief of strategic bombing, right? That strategic bombing will destroy the morale of the enemy. I think it's crap. I think strategic bombing 
emboldens the morale of the enemy, right? Um, and makes them more steadfast in their in their just cause. Um, so I think strategic bombing actually has the opposite effect of what LeMay thought it would in his entire justification for a separate air force uh, outside of the army in the United States. So I think he's a moron, but that, that's me. Um, so here I want to talk on the Russian side. Um, I, I mentioned in a previous video, assumptions. Assumptions are critical for planning. Uh, tactical through st strategic level. Um, basic assumptions are information gaps, right? Where we need to put fact in there to continue planning, right? So I use an assumption, which is something that I should be able to, I have to accept as fact to continue my planning. Um, I try to turn an assumption into a, a real fact, a hard fact, through um, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, um, reporting, what, whatever. I, information input can change an assumption to a fact. Or, if that assumption is, turns out to be false based on the information received, I need to throw it away because it's not valid. right? If an invalid assumption is is fake right not fact therefore i can't plan against fake i have to plan against fact all right and assumptions are believed to be facts um right so they don't make an ass out of you and me assumptions we need to believe as a fact to continue planning so russia made assumptions before they launched this offensive in ukraine all right some of these i've, I've hit on before number one Russia assumed air superiority. They assumed air superiority. That's not true. Ukraine maintains air superiority. Right? Um, localized, there's some localized parity and there's some localized Russian uh, air superiority. But across the breadth and depth of Ukraine... Russia does not have air superiority. Superiority, I would argue, Ukraine has air superiority, um, and that's a combination of air defense and air force uh, systems and personnel working together to gain air superiority. All right, so Russia assumed it, and because they assumed it, they assumed risk with their ground forces, um, with their air forces, with aircraft with large numbers of personnel on them rotary and fixed wing that were shot down uh, because they assumed air superiority they didn't have it and they've lost hundreds of personnel um, hundreds of you know infantrymen probably pretty good ones uh, probably some of their better infantry units because they assumed air superiority they do not have all right so awful assumption uh, number two Russian assumption that's not valid is they assumed weak leadership of Ukraine. They assumed weak strategic leadership. Um, as it turns out, Ukraine's leadership is strong, steadfast, and understands the game Russia's playing. And they're turning it back on them. Right? They understand propaganda. They understand information operations. They understand Russia. Uh, probably better than Russia understands Ukraine. Um, so there's number two assumption Russia made uh, that's not a valid assumption. Uh, assumption number three, they assumed a rapid collapse of the Ukrainian army, ground forces. Um, they assumed inferior equipment, inferior personnel, um, and that the big scary Russians crossing the border would cause them to, you know, evaporate. Uh, obviously, that did not happen. Um, has not happened. Is not happening. Ukraine is holding fast. Uh, Crimea was a different animal um, for multiple reasons why Crimea di was different um, than mainland Ukraine, uh, particularly as you get closer along the river and close to the capital. 
um, the Ukraine military did not collapse. It stayed. Um, it defended and it counterattacked in multiple locations in multiple directions simultaneously, and, and it's done it's done pretty well. The last assumption Russia made, which to me this is a really big deal, um, and it hits at the trust inside the Russian military and the Russian government. Russia assumed that they had a high operational readiness rate of their combat platforms. Russia assumed that they had a good capability and a large capacity of sustainment in their logistics units to enable their ground combat units to conduct sustained offensive operations. It doesn't look like any of that is fact. <laughs> um, so why? Um, I don't think the Russian army is a place where you can really be honest, right? About the operational readiness of your tanks, your BMPs, your BTRs, your, your BRDMs. Um, they're certainly not at a 90% OR, which is what we need to be at in the United States Army to deploy, right? Um, right, so nine, of, 9 out of 10 of our tanks need to be fully mission capable for you to be considered, you know, deployable. Um, I, I would assume Russia has a very similar standard, right? Um, but the re readiness reporting within inside the Russian ground forces and the Russian Depart uh, Ministry of Defense, um, they lie. They lied in their reporting, uh, which what that causes at the operational strategic level is overconfidence and capability and capacity that doesn't actually exist, right? Because they look at a tank company as having 10 tanks, right? And if they're 90% OR, they have nine tanks. I think the reality is their operational readiness rate's probably closer to 40 to 50%, right? So they think they're employing a tank company, they're actually employing a tank platoon right so i think this is for combat platforms i think russia is only able to employ a third of their combat power i think that's what the reality is their assumption was that they were going to be able to employ at least 90 percent of their combat power that's a that's a that's a huge delta inside of there all right, and I think that has really contributed to Russia's inability to have success. Right, because I don't, I just don't think in Russia you can you can honestly report, sir. My tank battalion of thirty-one tanks only has thirteen operation fully mission capable operational, you know, T ninety tanks. I'm probably getting fired, if not sent to Siberia, if not shot, in my body's never found. Um, so I need to report, sir, 31 of 31 tanks ready to destroy Ukraine. <laughs> and actually, I, I have 13. And then as soon as we cross the border, two of those die. <laughs> right? So I think that's... I think that's the reality of the Russian army, right? So they had made an assumption of 90% operational readiness rate in their units and that they had 100% uh, uh, capability and capacity for fuel, ammunition, uh, and other classes of supply through their logistics chain. And that's that wasn't right. Um, you know, so they planned more of a thunder run uh, kind of operation and they ran out of gas in all directions. Um, and you can see that play out in, in a lot of social media posts, um, Twitter, Instagram, Telegraph, uh, TikTok of Russian soldiers, <laughs> you know, BMP and tank crews going out there and like trying to, with jerry cans, trying to find gas. Uh, it's diesel. Um, put in their vehicles so they can continue their mission they're out of fuel right um 
And that's on combat platforms that probably also have a lot of other maintenance issues. Um, so I think that's the big assumptions that Russia made be prior to the invasion um, that were invalid. An invalid assumption can will cause catastrophic failure uh, in the system. All right. So flip flip the coin, and we'll look at why does Ukraine have success? Because um, if you look at active component ground forces, Russia's active component ground forces is three times the size of Ukraine's. Now, granted, I'm not Russia is not going to commit 100 percent of their army to invading Ukraine because they still have they're manned by military district. Um, so geographically, the United States Department of Defense does the same thing. Uh, very similar uh, in how we appropriate forces. Um, but this is, so, you know, guaranteed uh, NATO reinforcing in the Balkan states, uh, Poland, uh, Germany, that there's, Russia's maintaining a focus there as well. Um, cause the last thing Russia want to do is commit everything towards Ukraine and just <laughs> allow it we're, it's entering spring it's right it's not winter anymore um, and enable a ground invasion right in Moscow um, that that would be bad for them so how does Ukraine have this success all right with a ground force that's a third the size of Russia their integrated air defense system was in place, had a good air picture, so they had their radars in the, in the right locations, they had their surface to air, um, direct fire systems in the good, in, a, in the right place. Um, they conducted survivability moves with these systems and kept the network up, operational, pinging, providing the air picture um, to the shooters. All right, and as Russia comes in with the assumption of air superiority, they don't have it, right? Because surface to air systems are, are, are schwacking some Russian Air Force. Um, second on there in Ukrainian success is, is th their Air Force. Uh, whether, whether you want to believe the ghost to Kiev is real or not, I tend to believe it's, it's, a, it's real. Um, it's a real pilot, and he's had real success. Uh, and air-to-air -air combat. Um, but regardless, with the air defense system, the fixed wing of the Ukrainian Air Force are having success against the Russian Air Force. Um, and they're maintaining certainly air parity, if not Ukrainian air superiority, right? Because I, I think the air defense system gives Ukraine air superiority. Um, you know, so those those two that's that's huge. If you can control the skies, uh, you can you can prevent catastrophic losses to your armor formations on the ground. Uh, number three, Ukraine success is morale. This is this is a strong, determined people who, the, you know, a Russian invasion is an existential threat. If Russia is successful, Ukraine ceases to exist as a sovereign state. That drives and motivates people to achieve their purpose. Um, and Ukrainians are pissed off. And they're fight every one of them is fighting back. Um, they're armed. They're trained. And they're training every waking minute of every day to kill Russians. <laughs> so, you know, Ukraine, Ukraine's tough. They're really tough. Uh, they have terrain on their side. I think they have uh, the environment on their side. Um, you know, you've, you've, Russia's awakened a little bit of a beast here. Um, the last thing I'll hit up with Ukraine's success is their leadership. Right, and, it, I, and this plays in the morale as well. Um, 
And it was, the, it was a, a, a Russian assumption that's not valid. Uh, Russia assumed weak leadership. Fact is, Ukraine has strong, charismatic leaders who understand information operations and propaganda um, and how to counter Russian propaganda. They've been playing this game. Right? Uh, President Zelensky is he's my age, uh, mid 40s. Grew up, you know, he was born in the Soviet Union. Um, grew up the tail end of the Cold War. Right? He understands the game Russia plays. He understands the opponent. Um, and he's not going to give up. He's There's great pictures of him. Body armor, Kevlar on, out there with Ukrainian soldiers, with armed Ukrainian civilians. Accepting personal risk. You know, and that provides leadership. That builds morale. Um, legends like the Ghost of Kiev, that builds morale as well. Um, that is a, an example of leadership. Um, and then the, la- the second leader I'll bring up, and I'll say the, the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, they're all doing the same things as Zelensky is. They're out there. They are actively leading the nation. And people see it. Um, Sergei Kislitsky. All right, that's my best attempt at pronouncing his, his last name. But he's the Ukrainian ambassador to the United Nations. So, man, this guy looks... Every time this guy speaks in the United Nations, in the Security Council, in the General Assembly, he looks good. He says the right things with the right demeanor. He looks strong and he's an example to the world of Ukrainian resolve. Which is incredible. Uh, so I'm a big fan. I love watching him. Uh, I love listening to him speak. Uh, he's charismatic. He's to the point. And he doesn't take any crap. Uh, so I'm a big fan. Alright, so there's uh, assumptions. Bad assumptions, invalid assumptions on the Russian side that lead to failures, and some things on the Ukrainian side that have led to success. Um, let me pop over here, see if I can go down. I covered this before. Um, move my ugly mug out of the way. Um, this is Ukraine's active force, all right, and what the, and what they have in terms of tanks. Uh, BMPs, uh, armor personnel carriers, right, and some artillery pieces. They've got they've got a decent amount, all right. But like I said, Russia has three times this total in their active component, all right. So we look total tanks in the Ukrainian army look look like three thousand tanks, right? Twenty five hundred ish BMPs. I'm gonna pop down. We're gonna look at Russia, total force Russia. Um. Ignore the number of brigades and everything. That's that's bad. That's my bad. I'm awful. Get rid of that. But total active forces, you're looking at 900,000. I don't know why I fat fingered that and it says 99k. 900,000, right? Uh, Russia total active forces. When we talk about platforms, combat platforms, Russia, all right, there's two numbers next to each of these. The left one is active, the right number is reserve. Uh, 2,800 tanks. So you, Ukraine and Russia, active component tanks, not that, not a huge disparity, actually. You know, so in the active army of Russia, 2,800 tanks, are they going to employ all 2,800 of them on Ukraine? No. Maybe a third of that. Right? Maybe 900. And look at their operational readiness rate. I bet it's three to 400 tanks is all they're able to employ in and around Ukraine right now. Three to 400 tanks. I think that's probably all they can, they can dish out. Uh, infantry fighting vehicles, BMP variants, right? 5,200. 
Um, and on the active army side, tend towards the, the newer, right? So BMP 2s and 3s, you know, their reserve will be BMP 1s with some BMP 2s, right? Um, you know, their active components, T, T80, T90, T14, their reserves going to be T72s, T80s, right? Um, but we are seeing T72s in Ukraine, Russian T72s. Um, so there's still our T-72s in the active component uh, of Russia. Yeah, but as I mentioned, Russia's not going to commit all of this to Ukraine. They can't. It's, it'd be irresponsible strategically to commit all of your combat power to one theater. Uh, even at the at the height of the surge in Iraq and Afghanistan, the United States had had right around fifty percent of our combat power committed. Uh, just that's significant, um, you know. And that's between Korea, Europe, Iraq, and Afghanistan. About fifty percent of our combat, our active component combat power, is committed at any one time. Um, you know. So, Russia's not going to do that, not with the, the expanse and moving stuff. It's a, it's a lot of work. Um, so for whatever that's worth. Okay. Um, last thing I'll hit on, uh, kind of wrap today up. What are Russia's options? What what do they do next? Uh, we, we see reporting open source of Russia moving combat platforms towards the borders with Ukraine and possibly into Belarus. Um, so first thing I, the first question I ask is, Rush, is Russia going to reinforce success? Um, They're having success in the South. All right. South and, you know, in this eastern part, southeastern part. Are they going to reinforce success there, right? Which will, you know, a follow and assume or uh, follow and support type of role, commit additional combat platforms, combat power to the southeast and the south. That would make sense. Uh, but it doesn't achieve the end state Putin put out in his address a few days ago that said is the objective of this special military operation is to remove the government of Ukraine as regime change uh, as, the, as his end state so reinforcing success while to us makes sense right the uh, option number two is to reattack where Russia had failure right reinforcing failure uh, that's how I look at it, reinforcing failure. Uh, some people look at it, well, you know, the only reason we didn't punch through in the in the Kiev is because there wasn't enough combat power. If we apply more combat power, it'll give us the ability to, to punch through and we'll actually be able to seize uh, the, the capital. I, I tend to disagree because <laughs> there's, there's a reason you had failure. You know, and, and I'm, I'm not. I, I don't reinforce failure. I reinforce success. Uh, if I'm Russia, I go through the south. I reinforce in the south. So I bring all that stuff down here, and, and I would just own all these southern territories, right? And and own own the the Black Sea coast and the Sea of Azov. It's all mine. Um, I think I think Putin's going to reinforce failure. Um. I think you're going to see additional, I think you're going to see more armor heavy instead of mechanized infantry heavy um, to come and follow and assume and attack and, and attempt to attack uh, west, north, northwest in the keep. I think you're going to see the same thing. Uh, they'll reinforce, follow and assume follow and assume, right? So I think you're probably you're probably going to see 
you know, two to three divisions of combat power committed. That'll probably bring Russia up to about 40% commitment of their total uh, active component forces uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so, like, like I said, I would reinforce success, own the Black Sea. I think Putin's going to reinforce failure because uh, he doesn't like failure. The guy doesn't like losing. I don't like losing either. Um, but he's going to attempt to win Kiev. Right? Because that's what he said he, he's here to do. Um, so he got that. Um, and my, my next options are a little bit, they're a little bit more out there. Um, but Russian option number three. Can Russia open a second front? Right? Does this take NATO, United States, and Europe attention away from Ukraine uh, by opening a second front? Um, Finland has pretty much come out and said, we want to join NATO now. Uh, <laughs> Sweden's probably not far behind. Um, and immediately Russia responded and said, this is, this is a huge mistake. You don't want to do this. It will have repercussions, right? So if, if Finland is really serious and pushes in the next couple of days, that is a Russian option to attack Finland, right? And they're do, they'd be doing it in the late winter, early spring, uh, which isn't as catastrophic as doing it as in the winter, right? They don't want to fight another winter war. Um, but... A Russian, a Russian option is to open a second front. Um, it stretches their combat power and their capabilities and their focus. Um, but it, it shifts the focus of the United States and other NATO nations. Um, Finland immediately and Sweden both immediately become NATO members, though. <laughs> if that happens, right? Um, and the, la the last Russian option... You know, what if Putin fa refuses to lose? Does Russia use a nuclear option? He's threatened it. Right? Unimaginable consequences. Unimaginable consequences. What's an unimaginable consequence for assisting and aiding Ukraine? Well, it's nuclear. That's what it is. Don't. Don't look for hidden meaning in what Putin's saying. He's saying he will go nuclear. All right? So he has stated words to that, the effect that nuclear is an option. All right? Now, so if nuclear is an option, what are the triggers? Uh, that's, that's the question we have to ask, and we have to kind of figure out through uh, the lens of, of Vladimir Putin. Right? What are the triggers? Uh, I, I, you know, one one trigger would be direct NATO action in Ukraine. I think that's a trigger. Um, I think Russian failure to seize Kiev is a trigger. It's a trigger. Um, I I don't think it's beyond him to hit the button and affect regime change through the utilization of a tactical nuclear warhead. Um, some positives that Ukraine has is that air defense system, their air force, um, and if anybody picks up a launch or a drop. Uh, there's going to be a whole lot of assistance coming to shoot that damn thing out of the sky really fast. Um, but I, I, I really, he, he stated it's not, on, unimaginable consequences. He means nuclear. Um, that's a threat of thermonuclear war. Um, so don't, don't discount it, but figure out what, what his triggers are. Uh, what would cause to hit that that red button? Well, you know, there's there's probably a couple more that I I haven't completely thought through the problems that um, 
you know, what kind of strike, how is it limited? Does he go larger? Does he go regional? Is it a, is it a tactical target? Is it a strategic target? Is it multiple targets? Yeah. Um, that's the kind of analysis that need that's it, people are thinking it guaranteed uh, inside um, inside of NATO. Certainly in the nuclear powered nations um, are thinking through the consequences the triggers, um, and then the, the response, all right, and you have to work in the response, you know, we have to talk about Russia drops a tactical nuke in vicinity of Kiev, what's our reaction, and then what's Russia's counteraction, right, and, and, and war game this all out, um, and within there, you know, both sides will may be making additional assumptions uh, to continue planning. So um, it's my update today with Ukraine's quality uh, defense of their of their nation. Uh, Ukraine's doing a great job, um, and they they are getting overt material assistance now from the United States, the United Kingdom, Poland, Germany. Estonia, several several other uh, Central Western European nations are directly providing assistance to Ukraine. All right, no one's getting involved in the direct action, uh, but there's probably some other. Obviously, there's intelligence sharing. Um, you know, some airborne ISR, some things like that are absolutely happening as well. Um, but a lot of overt direct assistance. Uh, in the forms of weapons, ammunition, uh, sustainment capabilities, medical supplies, it is going straight to uh, Ukraine right now. So, um, see where the next 24, 48 hours lead us. Uh, we're coming up. We're in the middle of the night in Ukraine right now, uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern United States. All right, so we're in the middle of the night. Uh, we have you know, about four more hours till the sun starts coming up in Ukraine, which is when you would expect the next... Um, Russian offensive to begin all right so in the next couple of hours they'll start their preparatory fires um, and then as we get into midnight Eastern is when you, uh, Russia would actually launch their next offensive operation um, word on the street is they've ordered an all-out attack from all directions on Kiev we'll, we'll see um, I think it's going to depend did, did they get you know uh, reinforcing units in the position to enable that overnight yesterday uh, overnight you know what kind of fighting shape are they in if they've been moving all day moving moving tanks and bamps and burdens and putting them on trains putting them on flatbeds whatever to get them there driving them all across the road are they are they in fighting shape no they're tired pissed off all right um, I kind of think that's how that's how it looks on, on that perspective. Um, go ahead and order your all out attack. It's not, it's not going to be as effective as you think it is because uh, those formations need to prepare in position. Um, so if I'm Russia, I don't do it in the next 24 hours. I do it 48 hours from now uh, after I'm able to, to reset and generate that combat power because um, it's not ready to fight. Um, that's me. I'm I'm not Vladimir Putin. Um, I think he's he's I think he's going to try to throw them immediately into the fight, and they're not ready. Uh, and when you throw formations into a fight who are not ready, the the old ladies with their Molotov cocktails are going to have a heyday. Um, and, and and the Ukrainian civilians out there who are running around with U.S. and British anti-tank weapon systems. Uh, are going to get some good shots in. Um, so, right about 40 minutes, that's my that's my spiel. That's where I kind of see things right now. Um, I talked about some of the planning factors. Um, you know, I've talked about facts and assumptions. Uh, where Ukraine has success, where Russia's had failure. Hit through some, some Russian options, right? And those are... Uh, in my order, I think, like I said, I think he's going to reinforce failure. 
not reinforce success. Because uh, where he's had success doesn't achieve his end state. Um, I would personally, if I'm Putin, I adjust my end state, uh, redefine the mission, for to uh, what I can accomplish within my capabilities. I don't think Russia has the capability to seize Kiev and cause regime change. I don't think I don't think they have it. Uh, because of all the mistakes they made early. Um, and mistakes they made pre-invasion. So, uh, let me see if there's anything else people brought up and got questions about. Uh, yes, the United States has sent Stinger missiles. that has happened right so man portable air defense capabilities sent by the United States to Ukraine that has happened um, talked about logistics Russian logistics uh, low quantities of 125 millimeter main gun, ammunition, 122 and 152 artillery rounds and, and and bags. Yes, they're short. They don't have the capability to resupply very right very well right now. Um, we haven't seen many tanks. This has been asked uh, because these are mechanized infantry um, units that Russia is employing. There are tanks within there, uh, but the majority of the platforms inside the formations, uh, Russia is uh, committed to Ukraine, uh, prim primarily uh, BMP-2, BMP-3. Uh, we've seen um, BMDs because the airborne is here. Uh, we've seen some. B we've seen BTR, um, BTR-80s predominantly. Um, a couple BRDMs. It looks it's like a armored Humvee. It's it's easy to miss. Um, in the news, uh, but a lot of different BMP platforms with all kinds of crap: surface to air, radar, uh, command and control um, vehicles. So, been seeing a lot of BMP type platforms um, out there. So. Not a whole lot of tanks. The tanks we've seen have been really been T-72s. Every t at every I maybe have seen one T-80 Russian. Most of them are T-72s. Um, so they really haven't committed their newest best equipment. Can they afford to? That's are are you willing to accept and assume that risk at this point in the conflict? I don't know, <laughs> right? That's that's a question you got to ask Putin. I don't I don't think so. I wouldn't. Right. Uh, what else does Kiev turn into Grozny right right now I don't think I don't think so it doesn't have to because Ukraine is, is having success um, they don't need to go Grozny um, now you know, Russia is attempting to rubble parts of the city and they're then um they're having localized success with that, but Kiev doesn't need to turn into Krasny yet. We're not at that point. Uh, Ukraine's having success. Uh, is repelling Russian attacks. Is destroying Russian capabilities. Uh, Ukraine is controlling the skies. They don't need to turn Kiev into Grozny. Um, you know, is that a, is that a Ukrainian option? Abs absolutely. Um, and they know how, they know how to play that game, guaranteed. Um, but they don't need to do that. They're winning the conventional fight right now. Um, so they don't they don't need to go Grozny and turn it turn this into an insurgency. Not necessary. Um, you know. Uh, so that's there's a couple of things that come in questions comments concerns people have had that I just uh, went through and addressed real quick in, in just a few minutes so 
Um, you know, what important watch overnight tonight. Uh, watch what develops tomorrow. Um, you know, does Putin commit those uh, additional combat platforms and and units directly into the fight after they've transit, transited hundreds of kilometers over rail, um, line haul, and some of that on, on the, over the road, and bam, and put them straight into a fight. I think he, I think he, that's his intent. I don't think he, I don't think that's going to work for Russia. <laughs> so good, All right? Um, but there we go. Uh, about forty-five, six minutes uh, rambling for tonight. Pay attention in the next, you know, on on how Russia employs those those follow-on forces uh, over the next twenty-four, forty-eight hours, and and see. See if they're committed immediately. If they're committed immediately, um, I don't see this going Russia's way like they think it will. Um, so then, what are what are what what are the next set of options uh, as Russia goes back in the course of action development? Because they got they need they need more sequels. They're running out. All right. All right have a good night.